Hello everyone, welcome back from lunch. It's quite a walk we have to take before arriving to this room, so I hope you had time to digest your food already. We are going to have in this room the workshop that will um, about mediumship. So the idea here is that right at the beginning, I'm going to be um, going very fast to some of uh, the basic concepts until we get into some of the passages from the book and the domain of mediumship itself. And then I will we'll try to, my best to give at least 30 minutes for questions because I imagine this is a subject that will raise a lot of questions. Can you look at the, yeah. if we prefer to move around perhaps. Okay, you ready to start? Let's go then. So the first thing that we know about the Medians book is that it tells us that we are all Medians, okay? And that everyone is in any degree influenced by a spirit as a Median. So this is a basic concept that we have in the Medians book that is actually the most reliable guide that we can have in terms of learning and understanding about mediumship. So everyone that would like to be engaged in the subject of mediumship should actually read this book and from time to time refer to this book, try to understand and to grasp all the teachings from the spirits. But it explains here that we are all medium, but not median in a sense that we are capable of producing ostensive mediumship all the time. In which sense Kardec and the spirits tells us that we are median? In the sense that we are all capable of somehow from time to time feel and perceive the presence of the spirits, be inspired, receive an intuition, but it's not something that we can do on a regular basis and bringing effects, regular effects, that would be then when we could be considered to be a medium per se. So even when we are not consciously, uh, completely conscious, there is always going to be or very often we will have this dynamic here. We will have the realm of the discarnate spirits and the one from the incarnate one that we can communicate. For those who were this morning in the lecture of Dr. Schwartz, he's uh, talking already about a cell phone. While we don't have a cell phone, we have the ability in our minds in our organic beings, and not necessarily just spiritual beings, but of course spiritual as well, the possibility of perceiving and sensing the presence of those spirits and of communicating with them. So in the, the, the spirits books tell us that the influence of the spirits in our lives are much greater than we think, than we can imagine. So we start, uh, planning, start working in a, a, a certain project. It is going to be very uh, common for us somehow to attract spirits that will have the similar taste, that will have interest in the same kind of projects that we may be working. So what are then the levels of spirit communication? What are they? I always have problems with, uh, and this one is not mine, okay? <laughs> Electronics and things alike, I interfere with all of them. So, yeah, give me a moment. Hmm? Yeah, I know, but it's, uh, yeah. So the first level of spirit communication that we have when we can say that everyone is a medium is what we call subliminal level where it exists without an apparent manifestation. It's exactly the example that we had before 
of those two little guys, the incarnate one, the discarded one, communicating without uh, the incarnate one necessarily um, having the knowledge, the awareness that there is a, a spirit that somehow may be together influencing the spirit. And what we, we call ostensible or ostensive kind of mediumship, whether we are conscious, unconscious, or semi-conscious, we will be able to come with remarkable result, results. So there will be ostensive results, like we said, regular results. So this is the two different levels of communication that we may have uh, from receiving from the spirits. So in our daily lives, for instance, we, and we will keep, for the sake of understanding, we will keep calling that mediumship. Okay, that's why sometimes it's so hard for people to differentiate what is a psychic phenomenon, what is a mediumship, ostensive or no ostensive mediumship. But since we are talking about, uh, yes, the presence of spirits, yes, is spirits somehow being able to communicate through us, even if it's not a, on a conscious and such an ostensive level, we are still calling that mediumship. And one way that we can do that, for instance, is helping others. Every time we are going to be engaging in helping others, sometimes we know we are going to have spirits that may guide us. Have you ha ever experienced the, uh, in, in, your, in your lives, for instance, when you are talking to a friend and the friend comes to you and say, you know what, this is exactly what I needed to hear? And you say, I don't have a clue what I said that, but you know, I just felt like saying that to you. Or maybe you cannot even disclose to your friend this, but in, in, your, in your thoughts you will say, oh well, yeah, why did I say that? And it's actually something that shows us that we can have the presence, a presence of a spirit. On the same manner, on the same token, we can, when we are engaging in negative behavior, such as gossip, criticism, or any kind of uh, embellishments in terms of eating, um, alcoholic drinking, smoking, for instance, we can attract spirits that like that. They, they, you know, they live their lives using uh, eating too much, they love the pleasure of eating, or they like to gossip, or they like to criticize. So as soon as we engage ourselves in this kind of behavior, they will as well uh, attune with us. The emergence of mediumship can be spontaneous. It's not going to generate any kind of discomfort. And you can talk to some mediums and they will say, no, it didn't, in my case, uh, it was not something that was represented a lot of trouble. For instance, we know from the examples of uh, Chico Xavier and also Divaldo that sometimes, not that they had trial mediumship, but that, they, that their, their mediumship, although it's spontaneous, actually brought a lot of uh, trouble to them because it started very, very early in their lives when they were four and five years old. So can you imagine that? But there are some kind of mediumship that we call trial mediumship that will bring more disturbances. In any case, mediumship is given to us as a tool for our improvement, as a possibility for our inner transformation and beginning walking towards this path of enlightenment. So we always have to keep that in mind. Signs of mediumship can be uh, uh, or when mediumship can appear, it, it is regardless of age, place, social condition, gender. You can be young, old. There are people that say, oh my God, I'm not a medium. I'm never going to be a medium. And I always like to mention the example of Manuel Swedenborg. He started demonstrating his mediumship or f f for the first time he has experienced mediumship when he was 55 year old, years old. So we can never say, in, I mean, and he really had a very kind of ostensive mediumship. So we cannot say for sure whether we are not mediums and when it's going to appear. 
this is the one million dollar qu question and answer, of course, that everyone that comes to a mediumship uh, or a, to a, a spiritist center wants to know. Well, am I a medium? We still do not have any device that can, you know, look at you and say, yes, you are a medium. In the sense, like we learned here, everyone is a medium. But to engage or to be working or serving or uh, uh, having this communication, interchange with the spirit benefactors or spirits in a regular, on a regular basis, this is a different thing, a different, different story. So it can manifest itself wherever we go. So we have many examples of mediums that have never heard about spiritism. So mediumship, it is not a creation of spiritism. It exists throughout history. We have seen examples and examples of the work of the mediums through the ancient history, for instance. The signs may vary to infinite, for instance, unexpected emotional reactions, apparent sickness, shivers, moral and or physical indispositions, excessive irritability, moody aggressiveness, sleep disturbances, insomnia, or too much sleep. And when we read this list, we say, oh my God, I'm a medium. <laughs> <laughs> I have all that, and if not all of them at the same time, most of them. But we have to, you know, be capable. This is why, you know, it's so hard to say, am I a medium to answer this question? Because some of the, the, the signs that can actually demonstrate this extreme sensitivity that we may have are common signs related as well to, to our lives, to what we live in life. So of course, you have, if I have a, a disappointment, I can have an expected emotional reaction without being necessarily a medium. But why do we have those reactions being a medium? Oh, nourish disturbance and bulimia, anorexia as well. Because mediumship, when we are talking about ostensive mediumship, mediumship is organic is related to our physical constitution. Before reincarnating, we tell, we agree in the spirit world that we are going to be mediums, ostensive mediums, so to say. And so uh, our senses, the way that is going to work in this, the sympathetic aspect of our, uh, of our, uh, of our body is going to be uh, overstimulated, and they are the ones responsible for those kind of responsible of of of, of, uh, of uh, responses that we had that we showed before. So it's the sympathetic that is going to uh, emphasize or be uh, 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 more active when we are mediums. But we have to remember that it's not mediumship that it will be bring disturbances to us. Mediumship is a beautiful thing. It's a blessing. So it's not here, and we have not agreed to become mediums because we have to, to, to pay our debts from the previous incarnations because of karma, but because it's a beautiful instrument to help ourselves and to help others. So it's not mediumship per se that will bring necessarily certain reactions or, or let's say not so agreeable reactions on us, but also the kind of spirits with whom we attune. Of course, if we are talking about spirits of a highly evolved level, you know, we will feel like I don't want it to come back to earth. But when it is a suffering spirit, a needy spirit, then we are talking about something different. We are talking about, you know, some strange and um, more difficult uh, uh, reactions that we may actually experience. Like we said, when these, uh, they are elevated spirits, there is this aura of peace and well-being. Classification of mediumship. Roughly, we have this, the, the spirits 
brought through Kardec in the Medium's book, just for the sake of for us to understand a little bit more how to separate or to identify some of the faculties, the abilities that uh, derive from mediumship. They divide it in what is called physical effect and intelligent effect. So, in the physical effect, the question is that we have in the medium's book, can a spirit act without resorting to a medium? It can act without the medium being aware of it. In other words, many persons help spirits to produce certain phenomena without even suspecting it. So when things such as this one, you know, it's a table um, in terms of physical manifestations. What is the physical manifestation? Is when we all can see the results. Regardless if we are ostensive mediums or not, if um, this table here starts shaking due to a mediumship, mediumistic phenomena of physical manifestation, all of us are going to be seeing that, and all of us probably will be running to the doors, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why sometimes I think they are very, very nice with us, and they do not allow those kind of things to, to happen, because we may say, oh, we believe in spirit. Yes, I like spirits, and I wanted to see spirits, but when it comes to reality, it's not quite li exactly like that. We never know what kind of reaction we are going to have. Some uh, uh, of these physical manifestations, they are very spontaneous. So quite often we can see people coming to the spiritist center and say, oh, things are moving in my house, or oh, there are noises, I go there, I don't know where these noises are coming from. And the first question that comes to mind is, am I a medium? Am I the one responsible for this phenomena to happen? And the answer is not necessarily. You can be the one responsible, but it can be your neighbor. That poor guy is there sleeping, not knowing, not having a clue that is donating what we call ectoplasm. And the spirits that for whatever reason want to manifest in your home will gather this energy and utilize this energy to provoke the phenomena in your home. So this is when we can be mediums without even be aware of that. Or in a very, um, in an, an another example that are much nicer than this one, is for instance when someone, some people have the power of healing. So when you don't feel well and you have a friend that, or a family member that you know that, that when they come to you and they put their hands, their hands in your head, you feel good, they are actually presenting a manifestation of phys physical manifestation in terms of mediumship. My mother was like that. I, I had a lot of migraines when I, were, I was a child. And every time that I had those horrible migraines, my mom was the only one that could, you know, do something about. She would place her hands here, and wow, that was really powerful. So there are people that have this kind of ability. Uh, another uh, example is what we call pneumatophony, spirit sounds. Those were phenomena that were very extensively uh, researched by everyone that was engaged in, 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 in parapsychology and metaphysical studies to understand and to over and over try to evoke spirits to manifest and they would come and we would do that and everyone would be able to, to witness that. Nowadays it's much um, rarer for us to see phenomena such as this but of course they can still happen. Here, for instance, you can see a picture of this medium that she, through the octoplasma, that is actually a manifestation of physical f effect, phenomena, she materializes a trumpet that is going to be used by the spirit to uh, give and to make, imitate what we call the human voice or direct writing. Direct writing is when we have paper, uh, pencil, and with the ectoplasma donated from the spirits, 
You put a blank piece of paper there. You lock this uh, drawer, little small drawer. After at a certain time, you open the drawer. There will be a message written there. There was uh, an exhibi exhibition in the Metropolitan Museum in New York where they presented some pictures that were taken from the photography of mediums, they say. And they had an example of a letter that was attested that to be, to be written through this method that we call direct writing or pneumatography. And of course, the most fam famous one and the ones that sometimes people really would like to see is what we call the materialization. Of course, due to their nature, much more difficult to happen, but still happens, uh, happened before, happen nowadays. The most famous case that we have about spirit materialization, of course, is the case of Kate King, the spirit that through the medium, Florence Cook materialized it. And the reason that it's a famous case is because it was studied by Sir William Crookes, who is a great scientist and that received it from the, uh, the Queen of England, the title of, or uh, the king at the time, or queen already, uh, the title of Sir due to his, uh, his research in the, the uh, scientific field. And during, not for this experiment, for other experiments actually. And uh, he, for three years, he researched this phenomenon to the point of even uh, uh, drawing blood from the spirit, analyzing the blood sample from the spirit and the one from the medium and hair and of course coming to the conclusion that it was from a different person. And it's due to him that we have what is called also the 21 grams. Dr. William Crookes, during his experiences, he find out that he came to the conclusion that our spiritual body measures 21 grams. When we die, we lose 21 grams, which is still not enough to make us skinny, right? <laughs> Uh, and at that point, I don't care anymore, right? <laughs> it's going to be there. Who cares? Okay. So mediumship of intelligent effect is what we normally use, you, we nowadays use more in, the t in terms of mediumship uh, in the spiritual center. Is when we have not the ostensive uh, materialization or moving of ob objects, but we will have... On the other hand, the communications of spirits, most common cases would be what we call psychophony or psychography, which is or automatic writing, which is very convenient because we can keep proof of the communication of the spirit. The message is not going to get lost. We, this morning we were talking about the spirit Andrea Lewis that came give communications through Chico Xavier. And uh, we see that through the, uh, one of the abilities that a medium Francisco Xavier had was exactly of uh, that of psychography, which so far the latest number I have, he has produced 458. This is the most official one. I heard already about 467, but let's stay with the 58. That at this point is, we can see the amazing results that we can have to this kind of mediumship. And the one that we call transmediumship, where the mediums communicate through, this, uh, uh, the spirits communicate through the mediums, and in the same manner will bring messages or in the case that we are going to see, we will be able to communicate with the spirits to help them. So this is actually uh, some of the examples that we have on a mediumship of intelligent phenomena, intelligent effect. It can be hearing mediums, transcommunication, seeing mediums, inspirational mediums, presentiment mediums, there are 
quite a lot of variety of faculties and abilities in this sense. And we come to the conclusion of that first part that I said that I was going to see very briefly in order to come to the mediumship meeting per se. This is the workshop that is supposedly going to give you some knowledge about understanding how to work with mediumship and how to be capable of engaging in a work of mediumship. Of course, first thing that we learn about mediumship is that to learn about mediumship, it's a work that requires a lifetime and sometimes much more than a lifetime, which of course we cannot do in an hour and a half, but we are going to do our best to show more or less specifically utilizing the examples on how we work with mediumship in spiritism, which is slightly different from other uh, religions, philosophies that have the same kind of work, but they have different purposes. So, when the mentor here in the book, in the domain of mediumship, explains that mediumship in itself is not enough, is actually telling us that it's very, very easy for us to communicate with a spirit. If we gather four people here randomly, we could uh, call a spirit and receive a communication from the spirit. Chances are that one in four or five will be, or will have the, at least the rudiments of a nostensive kind of mediumship. But the thing is, it's not the phenomenon necessarily that is important, it's what we are going to be doing with the phenomena. What is the purpose of mediumship? It's just for me to communicate with others. Come on, we are barely communicating with each other nowadays, right? <laughs> We just spend our time in, in Facebook, like there is this little joke of the boy that says, oh, my mom has many invisible friends. She has friends in Facebook, right? It's, and we, have, we want different invisible friends. So we, we go to text message, uh, emails. It's so hard for us to want to be face to face or really engage in a conversation. Now we still want to, to have a conversation with the spirit realm, what is the purpose, what, in which sense mediumship can actually help us? And we are going to be addressing this question uh, in, the, uh, in this presentation. So the first thing that we do when we have is actually when we have the, uh, the interest of engaging in this kind of work is first of all, we have to have the basic knowledge in terms of mediumship. I cannot overnight decide to be a piano player and all of a sudden come here in front of you and play Beethoven. You are going to be running faster than if a spirit would materialize. It would be horrible, it would be an aggression to, your, to, to you. So, in mediumship, it's the same thing. I have to learn and understand the basics. They are not spirits that are there as, uh, to be uh, evoked or addressed to at any time that it pleases us. So, oh, you know what, I have half an hour to spare, I'm going to call a spirit and engage in a conversation. It doesn't work like that. So we have to have this basic knowledge it's always advisable for us to work in a group. Um, sometimes, you know, at least it should be good if we could have at least four people uh, to, it could be less, but less, you know, if some of them do not keep uh, the commitment to the work, we will wind up with three or two and it's, you know, so what's the point? Let's try to have at least a minimum of four people they say 4 to 14, it could be 4 to 20, up to 20. Why? Because when the group is smaller, it is uh, going to have a more frat fraternal relationship among them. And it's very important as well in terms of the energy for us to address and to call the spirits. So we are going to set a day, a time, and we are going to start a group 
with these people. We have to very carefully choose the people that is going to participate. Why? Because this is not a joke. This is not something, a kind of amusement. Like, you know what, I'm going to be here for three months and, uh, you know, what if we just start a mediumship group? It's not for this purpose. When you start this kind of work, it's also a commitment for life, or it should be. Okay, you should be very serious and understand why you are good doing that and what is the, are the results that we are expecting. In our mediumship group, or in our, in our spiritist group actually, sometimes people come to us and say, what are the requirements for me to become a medium or to, or, or to participate in your mediumship meeting? And we list some of them and then we say, the last one on the list is for you to be a medium. And they are quite surprised because they say, well, I thought that to be, to be able to participate in a mediumship meeting, I had to be a medium. And it's, it's not that. First of all, because like we, the example that we said about Emmanuel Swedenborg, you may start having no symptom at all, and you will be one of the most prominent mediums in the, in the mediumship group. Or you can start even having a lot of, you know, things that were happening with you and uh, everything is going to disappear, which is a sign that it was not mediumship but a spiritual interference. But it's still, you're going to benefit a lot from the mediumship group, per se. So, but the most important thing is commitment. It's a serious work. Very much like our professional lives, I cannot tell my boss, you know what, I'm not feeling like working today. I'm not sure if I'm going to feel like that tomorrow as well. But in three days' time, I, I, I'll probably be here. What your boss is going to do with you? <laughs> it, wh why don't you go to air age right now, right? Perhaps, you know, you're not, you're not feeling like you know, you're ready for this kind of commitment. It's the same thing here. The spirits count on us when we are there to do this kind of work. We arrive. Not necessarily we will have a table to sit. If you have, it can be more comfortable, but it's not necessary for us to do that. We are going to be elevating our thoughts, starting in, in a, a prayer, in order to attract the possibility of the communication with the spirits. It's important for us to arrive earlier because most of us will come straight from work and of course, uh, we are tired, we, we had some, many times we have difficult days, and when we arrive earlier, we have the time to feel the energy of the ambient. The, the, the first patients that the spirits are going to have are going to be us, okay? They will start working with us, working in our digestive system, or working with our cleansing our aura, our spirit, so that we can be of good service. In the meantime as well, the attitude of respect in relation to the place that we are is very important because they are already bringing the spirits that are going to be assisted. In spiritism, we work in, in, with mediumship in the following matter, manner. We, uh, in most of our meetings, our main goal is to address uh, needy and obsessor spirits. We are not there necessarily just to talk to highly evolved spirits, benefactors, mentors, and to, for them to be at our service to bring us just, you know, lofted messages, enlightening messages. It's actually very much like the prayer of Francis of Assis tells us, is in giving that we receive. And in giving is uh, in terms of mediumship, when we are actually committed to open our hearts and actually feel, even physically speaking, some of the disturbances that those spirits bring to us, especially the mediums, and to the meeting itself is the work of love, the work of charity. And when we do that, 
then the highly evolved spirit is going to be there and then they are going to be sometimes blessing us with some messages just to uh, for us to you know to go home and to feel good about ourselves and to have uh, this sublime presence manifested amongst us so we normally start with a prayer as a sign of reverence to the, the work, to the spirits that are there. They are actually the ones that are responsible for the work that we are going to be developing. And we start uh, creating among us this union uh, that through what was uh, mentioned this, this morning, the psychoscope the spirit of Andrea Lewis because they didn't, he didn't have at the time that much ability to see uh, uh, clearly everything that happens in the spirit realm because believe it or not, we have uh, this kind of deficiency in the spirit realm as well. It's not because we are dead that we are capable of looking at different levels of energy. And when we are talking about m higher uh, levels of energy, perhaps an average spirit, spiritually speaking, will not be capable of seeing that. It's like we, we still cannot see all the spectrum of light. We know that ultraviolet exists, but we cannot see it. More evolved spirit, they can see that. So we have to, when we, we have to want to see the um, certain, certain things and certain phenomena that we cannot grasp with our physical eyes, we have machines, we have some resources. So in this case, they have this resource that they call the psychoscope and this, this, the, the spirit realm, where they can see um, actually the energy field of the participants of the mediumship meeting. And so they, oops, sorry. They see, uh, like they say here, Andrea Lewis, uh, like a ray of sun on top of each one's he head, connected to the highly evolved spirits and connected among themselves as well. So the meeting begins after the prayer a medium is go one of the mediums that participate in the meeting is going to be getting into a trance and receiving a communication from a spirit as we can see here there they brought this spirit here to communicate the spirit is approaching the medium that is going through connect with him Peri spirit with peri spirit to bring about the message. What is interesting in this picture here is that for one difficult spirit that we have, we have three and one of them very highly evolved spirits helping in this process. So there are people that say, oh my God, I don't want to connect with a negative spirits. And I say, but do you want to connect with positive ones? They say, yeah, yeah, I want mentors, I want good spirits all around me. And I said, well, there is no best formula to do that, to guarantee the presence of this level of spirit than to do this. And this is one thing that we have to understand about this kind of mediumship. So in the conscious psychophony, what we have here is that the communicant spirit is going to communicate through the peri-spirit medium's mind, medium's brain, and utilize the vocal cords to convey the message. So this is one type of mediumship, what we call the transcommunication conscious phenomena, what it means conscious. Although the medium is actually giving the possibility for the spirit to communicate, it's not necessarily, it is actually most of the time um, absorbing the message uh, uh, at the same time that is, or be, even before the message is conveyed. So sometimes what happens is, um, 
even before the, the, the spirit starts speaking, the medium already know the story of the medium, the, the, the communicant. It, it can see, oh, this is, a, it's a spirit that has uh, died to, let's say, stroke, uh, feel a little bit of the pain, uh, have, has a glimpse of the story of the medium, and then the, uh, the communicant spirit, and then it starts uh, giving the communication. So what we see uh, is more or less like this. The medium here is slightly detached, the spiritual body, or what we call perispirit, and this perispirit of the communicant spirit go and connect, the connection is actually this one through this one, and through the physical body, the connection through the perispirit, the spirit is going to be giving the communication. And we see here another way of, uh, of us uh, looking at the work of the spirit through the medium. What is interesting here, in terms of us understanding the responsibility of this work, is the following. It's probably what you're still not looking. It is, you see those lines here? You see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All of those lines connecting with the higher force, the higher levels, one connecting with the other, are actually helping the median in this process and also helping the median to control the communication. Because it's not because I decided that I'm going to land my physical possibilities, and listen that I said physical possibilities, I didn't say my body on purpose. I don't give my body. I, I land my physical possibilities. That is not a complete takeover of my body, but the possibility of utilizing certain parts of my body to give the communication. And so, I have to be in control of what the spirit is going to say. I cannot just allow the spirit to talk the way it pleases the spirit. And this is when the work, the experience, the discipline, the medium starts understanding this kind of re request. So this is when uh, even they use our resor resources to show the spirit uh, scenes from his past, scenes from his passage into the spirit realm. And if you read the book, this is a very interesting story that we have uh, in, the, in the domain of mediumship, explaining the pain of the spirit, and also utilizing the energy and the work of everyone combined. So, one thing that we tend to think is that who would be the most important person in the mediumship meeting? Anyone would like to answer? You don't have to. I will answer. Because I know sometimes people may be afraid of saying the wrong answer. Many people will say, the medium. We cannot have a mediumship meeting without a medium. Wrong. It's not the medium. It, the medium actually is the one that has the most passive participation it's important, of course, it's going to be giving the opportunity for the spirit to, to communicate it. But the, what we call counselor or a spirit, is, is spiritual psychotherapist, the one that is going to be talking to, spirit, to the spirit is very important. The ones that are giving support for the spirit to communicate, they are very important because otherwise the spirit would not find the possibility of doing that. And in the case of semi-conscious, the medium it will also utilize, you see that there is already uh, uh, a, a, a slight, uh, a more distance between the physical body and the perispirit. So it's when, the more we distance ourselves from the physical body, the less we are going to be capable of remembering from the communication. That's the reason why there are some mediums that remember everything, some mediums that we remem rem uh, remember prior partially, 
and others that will have no clue what, what happened. In this case here, for instance, is an example exactly of an, what we call an unconscious psychophony. The median is capable of uh, uh, moving away in terms of spiritual body per spirit much more than the other medium that we said, which doesn't mean that this medium is more capable of doing phenomena or not. It's just a different sort of talent, so to say. So this medium is going to be able to do that and is going to be able to receive and receive the spirit herself to help the spirit to communicate. Uh, well, that's uh, kind of uh, change it. Uh, this is the same I conscious, the other one was the unconscious. Okay. Um, there are other cases of uh, much more disturbed sort of uh, manifestation of spirits that are not necessarily related <coughs> to the work that we do in mediumship meetings. This is more related to the cases where people, whether they know of spiritism or not, <laughs> whether they know of uh, 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 spirits or mediumship, sometimes they can be completely, uh, this is how they feel, that someone else took over their body. And it's what we call torture somnambulism, in this case meaning a very deep trance, in the case of a very deep trance. And here it manifests, and we will call this as being mediumship, but in fact is much more a representation of what an obsessive process can bring and how can influence the one that is being obsessed. I'm just giving a general glimpse about especially certain subjects like this one. Um, we always end the meeting with a prayer. Again, to help us release ourselves from any residues that may still linger in the room, any one of us, and in appreciation for the work of the spirits and everyone that was there. One of the questions that people have is, do we need to have mediumship meetings? Can the spirit do this work themselves? Maybe you have written already this question for me, right? <laughs> for later. It's a, an idea, but I'm going to be re answering now. The thing is, they do not necessarily need us to do, to perform this kind of work. But it's, it can be, uh, um, in the sense of collaboration, a very good teamwork. And why it is so beneficial actually to us, and most of the time more beneficial to us than to the spirits themselves? Because we have the opportunity of learning firsthand about the realities of the spirit world. They say that when a spirit comes to communicate in a mediumship meeting, many times we will say, we have nothing to do with the spirit, we are wrong. The spirits that they are going to bring, most of the times will be related to our community either to ourselves, the mediumship group in particular, or to the people that may come to the Spiritist Center for assistance, or uh, to us, or to someone in the neighbor neighborhood. The cases that they are going to choose to come to us will be cases that will directly help us, even if in an unconscious level. Many times, for instance, they can bring a spirit of a suicide. And we will help the spirit, we will address the spirit most of the time saying, you know, that God is forgiveness, 
that God gives us um, uh, always um, opportunities, uh, emphasizing uh, again forgiveness. And then we'll say, well, there is no suicide here, okay? Everyone is still alive. Not a suicide in this lifetime. But one of us may still be a suicide in previous existence and may still deal with the guilty that this suicide uh, provokes in us. Even if uh, two, three, four incarnations ago, now that we are more aware with the respect that we have to have towards life, and this guilty that we bring that is enrooted in our spirit, of course, affects our life now. And when we are hearing or even when we are the ones that are the, the, the spiritual psychotherapists talking to the spirit saying, listen, God is forgiving us. We are telling that to the other, but we are in this moment going through a process of catharsis, a spiritual catharsis that we also benefit us. So even in this case, it's not something that was just chosen randomly. It is something that is going to benefit the spirit of some of the components of the group. In the book, Mediumship with Jesus, written by uh, Dr. Lirio Cerqueira, he also explains to us that um, many times, uh, what we, we normally call it the anemic shock. The spirits, such as the spirits more, you know, with more, a more dense perispirit. They are so disturbed, so dis uh, disturbed that if they do not come and communicate through a meeting, let's say a mediumship meeting, uh, it can take longer their process of recovery. So what happens then? They come and when they are about to make this association with the medium, but of course with the participation of everyone else, they unload their burden, let's say that heavy cloud that they're, they're, they bring, in the medium. Who wants to be a medium, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, they unload that, and at the same time that they unload this energy, they will gather in exchange a, more, a purer form of energy that not only us, but everyone that is participating is actually sending to them. So here we are, have a spirit that, you know, is really that black cloud unloading and getting a little of the, I'm not going to say white because it would be too much presumptuous on our part, but let's say white. Okay, <laughs> part of you know all the things that we want for the good of that spirit. So they will live there, not necessarily reformed, but they will live there in much better condition to them, the spirits be able to do the job. Because uh, uh, Dr. Alirio even says, it would be very pretentious on our part to imagine that just in a conversation that normally takes 10, 15 tops, half an hour, we are going to make the transformation of a spirit. We cannot do our transformation in 10, 15, 30 minutes. And believe me, there are people that try to do that on our daily basis, right? <laughs> but how can we have the, uh, the, the idea that we could do the same? We can just prepare them better for what it is to come. So this is basically, uh, the most important thing for us. Another thing that it's um, uh, some of the questions that perhaps we could you could address is sometimes people say why a one medium it seems that it always gives the same kind of uh, communication. Uh, suicide will always come and communicate through, through this medium. Uh, the suffering spirit that just cries, cries, cries is always going to communicate through another medium. And the tough ones is going always to communicate through another medium. Sometimes there are people that even think that those mediums are faking or provoking what we can call animism as well. 
It is not. The spirits explained that because of you know, the nature, the mechanics of mediumship, it's easier to, let's say, to be capable to match some characteristics of spirits that are going to communicate with others, which doesn't mean necessarily that you were an ex-suicide or that you are, you know, a crying baby or that you are a bossy uh, kind, kind, kind of person, but you somehow have more the possibility of attuning with those sort of spirits and that is the reason why this is actually what we're going to be seeing more frequently. What is interesting is that after we finish the mediumship, uh, the mediumship work, it doesn't end there. The work continues. Some of us, we, we even have remembrances of on the prior uh, day or night of the meeting to be participating in a mediumship meeting in the spirit uh, realm or in the, the following night where the work is going to continue. And this is very common. After the work ends, everyone goes home. Not most of the time it happens at night because people work, and normally we work during the day. It could be at 3 in, in the afternoon, at 3 a.m. at night. It doesn't matter, but most of the time we do that, sometimes 7, 8, not even 9 p.m. So, there are cases that it still can be addressed after the meeting is over. And this, remember the first spirit that communicated, the first one that came with the three that I, I showed to you that there were three good spirits next to him? Okay, everyone awake there? <laughs> okay, hello. <laughs> okay, this is him. He's, much, he's a much better shape already, right? I mean, from that, uh, from that first drawing picture that we had of him. The story of this man is very interesting. He was obsessing a young woman, and this young woman went to the spiritual center searching for help. Oh, not necessarily knowing that she, she had an obsessive spirit, but she, he was her boyfriend. And of course, with his passing, she even may have had a clue that it, you know, it could have been the presence of the spirits. But of course, she goes to the spiritist center and says, I, I want to heal myself. I want to get rid of all of this. This is what sh she says when she is awakened. But when she is, is sleeping, the story is very different. She is the one that actually comes after him during the night and do not want him to leave her. So now she went for help saying, I want this spirit to be removed from me. They got the help. I mean, uh, both of them got the help. And now immediately, in the same night, she goes back already feeling the absence of him next to him, uh, next to her, and goes after him. So many times, we do not understand how much we are the ones that are actually bringing this kind of disturbances to ourselves. And this, you know, it's a fascinating story again. It's in the book. You can have all the details there. But I just brought that to you for us to have this awareness that not necessarily are the spirits there are, you know, trying to hold back on us, but we are not uh, the ones that are not letting go and everything that we are feeling as a result of this kind of uh, sick relationship is actually the result of ourselves, of our will, of what we are doing. So in this case, he, he, here now, the spirits will be working to actually try to, to prevent her to go after him when he's actually uh, already receiving treat treatment and in a much better condition to understand what happens to him, his passing, and start all this process of go, uh, growing again. And 
one thing that Kardec does with us is the most important thing in spiritism is not mediumistic phenomena, but its principles and its moral consequences. I always like to bring this idea of Kardec because after we spend hours <laughs> and lifetime studying and trying to understand mediumship, he says mediumistic phenomena is not all what is important. Important is the principle, the moral consequences. If we do not learn from this tremendous possibility that we have, this blessing tool that some of us may have been, gr been granted, and others that not necessarily have it directly, but is a member of a group that works with mediumship, for instance, we will be wasting a precious opportunity. Mediumship, in the way Spiritism understand, is a blessing that we receive for our spiritual betterment, is a way of transforming ourselves by being capable of having compassion for others, of understanding the suffering of others, that if it, they, they are not our own right now, we can be sure they were in the past, or we can never say what the future holds for us. So it's very important for us to start developing that. And it's only by the amount of love, compassion, and charity that we have within ourselves that we are going to be capable of knowing more or less how well we are doing in this process of evolvement. Other than that, it's, it's still a long way to go. So if we have this possibility, my advice, the advice of that we receive from the benefactors, from those that have been working with mediumship for so long, will always be this one. Do this work, embrace this work with love, with dedication, and having the understanding how important this work can be for you, for your life, for your family members, the community in which you live, and from the benefit of the planet. And in this sense, we are going to be able to um, actually get advantage this time of this knowledge, of this understanding. So this is what I had to present for you today. And I'm going to be open for a Q&A session until 3 when we have to stop. Okay, I, I just need you to speak louder because I have a hearing problem, so, okay. As a medium, who is a psychotherapist? Is it at all assigned to certain members or the most experienced? Can I ask you to speak in the microphone, please? Thank you. As a medium, who is, uh, takes the role of psychotherapist? Is it the most experienced person at the meeting at the group, or it uh, depends on what kind of situation you have to handle, mm -hmm. or it depends on um, mm -hmm. kind of like for the purpose of training? Okay. With, with the different people involved in this. Okay. So, uh, when we were emphasizing that the medium per se is not the most important person, everyone is important. It's just because we tend to believe that since we are talking about mediumship and mediumship meeting, the medium is the one that is going to be uh, propitiating the possibility of, bring, of co giving the communication from the spirits, we tend to believe that they are you know, the stars of the show. This is not true because everyone is important. So the median is important because it's going to bring this give this possibility. The spiritual psychotherapist is very important as well because uh, if they do not have not only the knowledge, the expertise per se uh, in terms of how to address the spirit, if they don't have the heart 
if they don't have the compassion, they will not reach the spirit. There is a very beautiful story of one of the spirits that is actually one of the greatest mentors that we have in spiritism that is called Dr. Bezerra de Menezes. And, uh, and this story describes Dr. Bezerra in a mediumship meeting where he is uh, playing the role of the spiritual psychotherapist and it was a very difficult spirit communicating, very rebellious. And at the end, the spirit turns to Dr. Bezerra and says, you are changing me. I'm hearing what you say, but not because of your words, but because of the love that I feel that comes from you to me. So it's, so it's very important, but then, it's not only the love that comes from the spiritual psychotherapist, but also from the, the, what we call the supporters of the meeting. Sometimes people come and say, oh, you know, I'm not a medium, I'm not a spiritual psychotherapist, what is my role here? I said, it's pivotal. Because you are the one that is giving the support for the medium to give the communication, for the spiritual psychotherapist to be capable of you know, receiving this intuition, enlightenment, how to address the spirit, but at the same time to address with love. And they are the, one, they are the ones that will provide all the support and all extra love and compassion that will actually help us to reach the heart of this spirit so that they can change. They are there let's say, die <laughs> to change, but no one pay attention to them before, or they are so lost, they are so much in need, and when they see a group such as this one, you know, sending all this attention and love, is when they actually change. More questions? Um, it's good because then everyone else can okay. hear as well, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Um, you mentioned that um, the spirits come to the that some, that some certain times, um, certain mediums um, receive or accept uh, certain types of uh, spirits because there's some affinity. Um, and my question to you is this, according to the level of knowledge and experience from, from a group, for instance, I'm participating in a, in a we're studying, it's a mediumship studying group, and I noticed that um, the spirits are easily convinced meaning that it doesn't take a lot of time to really touch their mm -hmm. hearts. Is that providential? Is that the, the spiritual realm really working in, in organization to mm -hmm. make, the, make us that, that possible for us mm -hmm. to be successful or to, you know, to see what goes Oh, on? thank God it is. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very much, let's say that we are uh, medical students, okay? And, of course, we have to start some, somewhere. Normally, they, when you, your first surgery we will be probably an appendectomy. Okay, they will not put you to do a heart surgery, open heart surgery, or a brain surgery at first. So it's the same thing in terms of our work. The more we start working together, the more we start understanding the mechanics of mediumship, the more we grow in commitment, discipline, responsibility, the more as well, the cases are going to become more difficult or more complex, uh, but at the same time, where we will feel even more fulfilled and reward even when we do not see the immediate transformation of the spirit, but we know that you know, this process is happening. But if, evidently, this is what happens. They will bring uh, cases that we are going to be capable of handling. And they know as well, as well, they know that, you know, um, our self-esteem is, is still something that we value that so much. And I mean, when we feel that we are capable of helping, and we have those immediate results, we feel so good about ourselves. We feel like, oh my God, this is great. I wanted to come, come go back. When it comes for more, the more, more difficult cases, <laughs> we face a lot of frustrations. Because, you know, it doesn't matter how much love we send sometimes, the beautiful words that are said, <coughs> it's, 
we will sometimes not see the same results immediately, but it's, it, this is what happens. <coughs> it's charity, my friend. <laughs> At this point, to me, I don't know if for everyone else, but. <laughs> Just sorry, thank you. My question is, uh, as parents, if we notice that our children at an age of adolescence or younger, possibly, start to exhibit the mediumistic phenomenon, what's the best way to help our, our children do that uh, experience? Very good question. And if you go to www.spiritist.us, <laughs> you can download for free the entire course of mediumship uh, in English and already translated to Portuguese because this time we did the other way around. It was written in English and uh, it has become a good a success and then people asked us to translate to Portuguese. And we have a whole class lesson only about this subject. Okay, www.spiritist.us which is the uh, uh, website of the United States Spiritist Council. The thing is, our children nowadays, thank God, because they are a better version of ourselves, but uh, you know, I cannot wait for them to receive us back and we are going to be the ones that are a better version than themselves, and they are going to be the ones that will say, ah, <laughs> ah remember that you said I, um, I, I was not such a modern machine, now I'm better than you. I came with more ship than you had before. Anyway, so of course they are coming in a much more uh, uh, advanced version, like uh, Benjamin Franklin also said in Tombstone, what he wrote for him, Tombstone, I'll be back in a better, better version of myself. Uh, and they are actually presenting more of the sensitivity. But using what I have just read from Kardec, we as parents, educators, or spiritist educators, should understand that we, um, even when we are talking about mediumship, the phenomena per se, we are, uh, it's not the mediumship, but the result of the phenomena, which is my personal growth. And this is what we are going to emphasize with, especially with children, in terms of uh, giving them a good moral, ethical basis on how to behave in life for the sake of themselves, not because of others, but when we are good, law of cause and effect, we reap good as well. When you're not, we know what's going to happen. When we are talking about teenagers, uh, some of the teenagers may uh, present more uh, ostensive aspects of mediumship, but even then, we have to be very careful on how to introduce mediumship to them. As much as possible, we should refrain from using them as mediums. We should enlighten them, bring them the knowledge of mediumship, very much like we bring ourselves. And we have to remember that because we are talking of uh, organic phenomena, and that is set, sets on the basis of our uh, even brain activity related to our nervous, nervous system, the sympathetic uh, side, um, we, uh, uh, before the age of 18, the brain of the teenagers are not even read. So we should try to wait for all this formation. And plus, on top of all that, if we adults cannot have or find it difficult to deal with the seriousness of mediumship, the commitment, the discipline, because listen, you decide, you can decide to use your mediumship or not, it's up to you. You can decide to be part of a mediumship group or not, it's up to you. And normally when people come to us and say, 
Should I come for the mediumship studies or mediumship meeting or should I go to studies? We say go to studies. It's going to be more beneficial to us. Why? Because even if you are an ostensive medium, you do not need to sit on a table and work your mediumship. You can, ch because what is the mediumship for? It's for us to help ourselves and to help others. So I cannot, for a certain reason, utilize my gift, my faculties, in an ostensive manner. I can use them in a non-ostensive manner, dedicating to others, volunteering in hospitals, in nursing homes, cooking for, for shelters, whatever good you can give to the world, you can be rest assured that you will not have any side effect of not using your mediumship. In fact, because I am in a neutral crowd, when I'm not, it's more difficult when I have to say that, but I will say it anyway, <laughs> because you are a neutral crowd. Um, when people come to us and say, oh, um, I'm a medium, I used to work with mediumship, and I, I need to go straight and work in your mediumship meeting, uh, because, you know, otherwise it's something bad is going to happen to me, or blah, 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 all these kinds of things. They say, ah, oh. it's actually the best alert that I can have to say, well, this person has to learn a lot about mediumship. They don't know nothing about mediumship. So it's a completely wrong misconception, idea that someone may have of mediumship. I experienced that myself. I'm a medium. For a certain time I was um, working in, in, in London. I could, we didn't have the mediumship meeting. I never had to go to, you know, I never had any problem like getting crazy because I'm a medium and I'm not working my mediumship. You, you go and do other things give the water in the center, work in the passes, work in the presentation. Come on, they don't materialize themselves. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Sometimes, like I say, I spend a whole day just looking for the perfect image. You know, there is always something you can do. And you, when you are doing the work of goodness, this is what mediumship is for. So in this case, in the case of the children and teenagers, there is no need for us to immediately introduce that. Many people will say, well, but remember, we have examples of Chico, modern examples. Chico Xavier, four years old. Divaldo, five years old. Come on, they are different, uh, um, um, examples in terms of what they represent in the history of spiritism. The, even the sister Fox that were very young or the mediums that worked in, with Kardec at that time that had like a, between 12 and 15, 16 years old. But remember at the time of Kardec, with 14 years old, you were getting married. So we don't remember that. We just say, oh, they were 14 years old. And those were different times where those spirits came prepared for a mission. And they were assisted by spirits in order to help them to counteract eventually, you know, some physical side effects that they had. And come on, how many of us would be able to withstand what Chico Xavier and Divaldo Franco had to cope with because of their early demonstrations of mediumship. They were beaten, they were criticized, they were, uh, you know, called crazy, they went, you know, through all difficulties and burdens and so the best thing is let us wait, let us give them the theory and Exceptions may exist, we are going to be addressing exceptions, but as much as possible, let us delay their engagement in the mediumship meeting. I think we have time for I normally say that that's the reason why I'm a presenter, because I have to speak, I don't have to hear. <laughs> 
Yeah. Not, uh, what is it that uh, sometimes during our uh, study sessions, mediumship study sessions, not the actual meeting, uh, a lot of people in the rooms are feeling sick and you know suffer uh, strong influences. And what can we do to better protect ourselves? Mm. What a question, right? <laughs> I wish I had the answer. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that we know we can do is actually strive not to take the wrong path. And the more we persist in the good, the more we will actually be building our own protection, not necessarily depending on the protection of the spirits. But because it's like the law of physics, like attract like, the same way that when I, I am capable of uh, uh, enlightening myself, of uh, resonating a different tone of energy, I will be more prone to connect with this kind of energy as well. Remember the story that Jesus said to the one that uh, was giving and didn't use it will be taken, but to the one that received it and used it more will be giving even more. It's more or less like that. You know, it's not that it's going to be given more talent, but in terms of protection, I already, I, I already work it in what I, I have to do for myself. Of course, in the meantime, while, while we still are not capable to, you know, at least maintain 24 seven this <laughs> zane or vibe that we could, uh, we could radiate around us, we always can, can resort to prayers as, as soon as we feel uh, some of the symptoms of, uh, yeah, something wrong is it's, it's happening. Sometimes it's like, you know, you smell rain coming. You know, you start paying attention before the rain comes. Okay, so it's the only thing we, we can do. Um, of course, um, when we are striving in this path of goodness, we will awaken um, opposite forces that will try to remove us from this path. Why? Because they have a personal problem with us? No, because they have a personal problem with being good. When people become good, they are obliged to be good as well. It's very easy when we say you, you do something wrong and people come to you and say, wow, you did that. And you say, well, everyone does. But when everyone stops doing that, you do not have the excuse anymore of saying everyone is doing that. And it's the same thing for the spirits. They feel that they can delay somehow their advancements while they see that we are not doing the good that we can. But when they see each time more the transformation, it's like, you know, a call, a strong call to them saying, you know, this person was not such a nice person. Look at them now. They are doing, they are striving to change. So basically this is um, one of the things, one of the reasons why they try to stop the work of goodness. But we persist. It's also a test. Uh, in every, uh, when you still, I always like to study, you know, the Egyptians, the Greek, and all this initiate, initiation process that they had to go through uh, to learn about the mysteries, and uh, you have that in other philosophies as well. And, and, and it's like, you know, it's like trials, tests that we go through. And it's the same thing. If we would say, what would be the kind of initiation for you to work with your mediumship? It would be that, to withstand the, the rain that is coming in your way, you know, and protecting yourself as, uh, as much as you can, because the rain, the torment will go away. It's just a matter of us persisting. And do our homework, do what we have to do. I don't know if we have time for another question, I think. The last question. Well, first of all, thank you. I had a two-part question and you asked the first part, mm -hmm. which I was going to ask about, uh, just to have you talk about the lifestyle 
all the people who have been working on the leadership teams. So I, I think you're ready to answer that. Uh, the second part is if you can just clarify to everyone here the requirements for people to, to get in there. I know it takes a lot of studies to, to be what we call a doctor, I heard another term here. Uh, a spiritual psychotherapist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to clarify that so people understand it's not just, you know, you show up today. Mm -hmm. I'm a psychologist, so I think I can also be a, a spiritual counselor. Just give my okay. okay, first of all, I'm, I'm going to address a little bit the first part of your question because it's actually very important. It's a little different from what he said. Medians, participants on mediumship meetings are not saints. They are not more special than anybody else. Okay, uh, we cannot imagine that they do not go through burdens to sufferings and to happy moments and to disappointments with themselves. Because sometimes we look at the mirror and we are ashamed of ourselves and we wanted to try to do better like everybody else, okay? Uh, we have, through this work, the possibility of, uh, you know, having more motivation on under or understanding on the need of doing that. But we fail many times, we catch ourselves up and we try again. So there is nothing special about being a medium. It's an, uh, just another opportunity for us to grow. And most, and even the spirit of Emmanuel say that, especially the mediums are the, the ones that owe more to society in general, spiritual and physical, and that's why they have asked for this uh, gift, let's call it this way, okay? Um, the second part is in terms of requirement. We, um, we know that in Brazil there are courses that it takes like five years, six years, from three to six years for you to be able to participate in a mediumship meeting. We don't have the same kind as far as I know here in the US and other parts of the world. We don't have courses that are that long. Uh, sometimes we, we, we have courses that are long, but uh, what the, the mostly the requirement is, is for you to have the basic knowledge. And uh, one of the reasons why those courses can be very, uh, extend, uh, very long in Brazil is also because we, sometimes we are talking about a class that we will have 100 students versus here a class that you have five students, you go in a different rhythm. So it's a, a also important for us to know that. We emphasize study all the time because it's the only way that we can learn, we can grow, we can get motivation, and you, we can use this gift well. Of course, for someone like yourself that is um, already uh, skilled in terms of um, um, because of your profession to, co uh, to, to converse with spirits and not only that but sometimes also in what we call the fraternal assistance in the spiritist center as well it can be much easier for you to understand the nuances of the pain and how you can address the spirits but then again remember that the spirit and is was a medical doctor and when he went to the spirit realm they told him well you know you know medicine from the physical body when we are talking about the mind and the spirit is a different thing in terms of so we do not know exactly what god has in store for you uh, definitely your skill could be very well utilized and my advice would be for those who have this kind of skill, even if you do not have a degree in this sense, per se, perhaps, you know, uh, enlightening yourself more with the spiritual values, the moral values, would be a good way of, uh, you know, um, um, uh, I want to say, uh, to excel even more what you already have. And uh, always never forgetting that the main component in this case is going to be how much love and compassion you will be capable 
to give to the spirits that are going to communicate. You can have all the skills, but if you do not have, we are not saying that only love is important because then we would be nullifying all the need of us understanding and the study. But it's a very, very a crucial component in this sense. And uh, so if you are already halfway track the other halfway and serve as best as you can. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope it has been productive to you that I could give some of the insights about this work. We, like we said, we didn't have too much time, but I think we, we have covered a lot of subjects and now you have a lot of food for thought. Thank you and thank you God.